Hey everybody, we are here on the street. We are going to be asking strangers questions about their favorite things to be open and candid about their money and the personal decisions they make with their money. What could go wrong? Oh, people, excuse me, sir, ma'am, can I uh, ask you guys a couple of questions? Do we have cameras over here? Sure. If we could turn. It's not going to be anything too personal, I promise. How much money do you guys make annually? That's not personal. <laughs> What do you do for a living? I'm a pharmacist. A pharmacist. How much money do you make as a pharmacist? Uh, it's decent. But like, how much money though? Oh, we want to try the real numbers. Real, yeah, real numbers. This is a real video. Real numbers. Uh, it pays rent. How much? Uh, how much money do you make? Um. In like a year. I'm not comfortable sharing these information with anyone else. Why? Why not? Why won't you just tell me the number? Like, it's just us. I mean, it's pretty good. Like, but like, okay, you're not gonna tell me. Uh, that's that's fine. I thought we were friends. Are you feeling more bullish or more bearish these days? Uh, more bearish. Feeling bearish. Do you know the difference? Uh, no. I don't really know exactly what you're asking me. I don't know. I feel like a lot more people get eaten by bears than get eaten by bulls. Um, would you say that you are a generous person? Um. Too. That took too long. You're a selfish person. <laughs> what kind of credit card do you rock in these days? Um, Who is he? I have an army. Let me see. Yeah. yeah. Take it out. Get a uh, four or seven. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I love it. I have that one. Yeah, I have. The, I was just looking because I have the same one. Who was like your favorite teacher growing up? Do you remember their name? Yeah, her name is Miss Bannock. Miss Bannock. Oh, man, that's. I don't remember that. Yeah. Did you have a favorite dog? Like, what was, your, what was his name? Uh, his name was Zeus. Wow, yeah. Sacrilegious. What did you say your last name was? What's your mother's maiden name? Uh, How much money is in your bank account? What is your mom's maiden name? Um, Gun, I think you're gonna hack my banking account with all this information now. Oh, no, 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 this is for church. Nothing ever sketchy ever happens behind the scenes at church. But was Gun with one in or two? With two. What are the last uh, four digits of your social security number? Uh, 4243. 4243, okay, perfect. Wow, I think that's all we need. Do you have any financial advice for me? I'm a stand-up comedian. Are you really? I, I, well, that's very offensive that you would ask. Yeah, well, you, you, you said that in a way that was like, really? Honestly, I actually, I'm a stand-up comedian, but my dad is a pastor, and he'll just pay me to do things like this so that I don't have to move back in with him. Well, spend your money. If he's just going to pay you to do things like this, by all means, spend it and keep doing things like this. I think that I'll probably just write out this whole dad is a pastor thing as long as I can. <laughs> I would, too. Ma'am, what is the most expensive thing you've ever bought that he doesn't know about? What is your least favorite thing about the way she spends money? Going to the mall and, and spending a lot of time. But what's your least favorite thing about the way he spends money? Sports and hunting. What are the odds of you guys having a fight after this? 100%. I think I think we'll be okay. You said 100% and you said you think you'll be okay. So that's good. Sounds like a fight. Uh, my bad. How are you? Well, before I was a stand-up comedian, I briefly held a job a in the finance industry. Comedian, really? So yes. it's a joke, right? We're gathering right. information, and then we're probably not going to use it for anything. Uh, like my wife says, you just don't open up to anybody about finances. This is actually for a church thing. So I'm representing the church right now, so you can, all this is just between us. It's not going to be. It's not going to be shown. It's not going to be shown to anyone. But what kind of credit card do you have? I think we're done here. Thank you. All right. You guys have a good one. Yeah, so comedy thing, I think it's going to work out, you know? I mean, I believe in myself. You should, but yeah, I mean, you're really not that funny. I'm not funny all the time. Like, funny I, looking. Like, I'm not, okay, wow. That. Can we cut? <laughs> People get funny when you talk about money, right? So we're going to be talking about it for a few weeks. Here's what I want you to focus on. Uh, in Jeremiah, he said that we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You bring what? Sacrifice means that you got to do something. You have to offer something. It needs to cost you something. Worship is not a spectator sport. When you come into the house of the Lord or when you're watching on Facebook and you want to worship, you can't be a spectator. You got to be involved. And so we bring the sacrifice of praise where into the house of the Lord. And then in Psalms, uh, Psalm 100, one of our favorite songs, we're not doing it today, but we do a, a song based on Psalm 100. And it says, that his love endures forever. So he's worth offering 
a little bit of time, a little bit of energy to get into his presence and to get his presence into us. Would you agree with that? So think about that today. We bring the sacrifice. What do you bring into the altar today as we worship? Let's stand and let's sing.
eyes to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay
We have a song that's new to us. It's an old song. It's called The Goodness of God. And when I think about this song, um, Janie and I, several weeks ago, I, I played her this version. And we just sat at our kitchen table and wept because we think about the goodness that God has given and poured out over us. And, and I told Rachel when we were talking about this song that, that I think about King David. King David in Psalm 23, he said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me uh, lie uh, in green pastures, takes me beside still waters. But at the end of that, at the end of that, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And David, I believe he wrote this psalm when he was at the end of his life. He's already run from, from Saul for 12 years after he'd been anointed king. Um, he knew what it was like to be in the valley. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. I will not fear because you are with me. And so I think he's looking back at this life of just ups and downs, just valleys and mountain peaks and valleys and mountain peaks. And he says, this one thing I know, that the goodness of God is going to pursue me all the days of my life. Let that thought fill your mind. As Rachel said. Oh, my. 
Can anyone else testify that God has been good to you? I couldn't finish the lyrics of the song because God has been so good. Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And this is our invitation to you. If you've never experienced God, if you don't have if you don't have peace with God, meaning you're not his child, you cannot have the peace of God. But if you are his child, everything that he gave to Jesus is available to you. So our, our challenge to you today and every day is taste and see that the Lord is good. His goodness chases you. If you're not experiencing it either Either you've chosen to be in the wilderness, you've chosen to walk away from God, or the Holy Spirit of God has led you into the wilderness because we know the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. There's only two reasons to be in the wilderness today. You chose to be there, the Holy Spirit of God led you there, and you're there for two very different reasons. If you chose to be there, you've got you to confess your sin and come back to God. If the Holy Spirit of God has led you there, then you need to endure and learn what he's teaching you. I think we're in this worldwide pandemic because God is trying to see who is serious and who is not. Father, we thank you that your goodness is chasing after us. And may we be a church that learns that and reflects that and shares that with a world that desperately needs that message. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for calling Money. I'm here to give you financial advice to make your life better and you better at life. This is Money. How can I help you? Karen, what? Get out of here. Karen, we have not talked since your piggy bank days. How are you? Hello, this is Money. It's a great day to be green. Yes, the environment is important to, uh, I was referring to green, the color of my shirt, which you cannot see, uh, and the fact that I am the embodiment of money. Uh, I should get a better slogan. Absolutely, Kevin, I can tell you your net worth right now. It's nothing. Yeah, no, like 0, 0.00. But listen, hey, even though you're technically worth nothing in like, you know, dollars and cents, did I ever tell you how much our friendship means to me? It is this much. I don't know, Karen, at the end of the day, what's the real difference between the 10 and the 11 Pro X? Whoa, three lenses. We just have to tool around with your financial plan, but we can get it, all right? Yeah, your security code is 616. Oh, you just bought it just now, that was quick, okay. Uh, well, can we talk about your new plan? Karen? Karen, hello? It's weird as if you like hung up the moment I said plan. Uh, you spent $72.34. Can I just say, that's a lot of McFlurries for any one person, you know? Listen, Sonia. I know we've been on the rocks, but I don't want to give up on this, okay? I'm just asking that you check up on me every now and again. If you don't talk to me, I can't help you. Leon, hey, oh my gosh. That's a lovely boat, man. A power boat for a power man, and that is you, buddy. Yeah, uh-huh. You want to buy it? <laughs> That's a good joke. Oh, you're serious. Okay, um, well, if we do want to go ahead with it, we're going to have to make some changes. Uh, so that probably means no more food, shelter, or water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you're right. It's a gorgeous boat, just like you. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you later. You bought that boat. <clears throat> Look, it's your money at the end of the day, but I'm just trying to give you advice to help your Washingtons become Lincolns. You feel me? And then those Lincolns can maybe one day become Hamiltons. And then those Hamiltons can become Ulysses S. Grants. 
That's the 50. The $50 bill. Mm-hmm. And then those Ulysses can become Benjamins. Woo, woo, woo! Oh, man, Karen, you're the best. No, you are. No, you are. Man, I'm so glad we took the time to reconnect. Let's do it again sometime soon. How about tomorrow? I'm, I'm rereading a book called when, when the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box by John Ortberg. He's one of my favorite pastors, and I wanted to share this story with you. Once upon a time in Silicon Valley, there lived a busy, important man. He routinely logged 12 to 14-hour days at his job and sometimes weekends. He listened to business books on keeping up with the sharks and leadership lessons on a special MP3 player in his car that sped up the reader's voice so that he could get through all the books in half the normal time. Even when he was not working, his mind drifted towards his work so that it was not only his occupation but also his preoccupation. He found that the 40-hour work week was such a good idea, he often did it two or three times in one week. His wife tried to slow him down to remind him that he had a family. He knew that they were not as close as they had once been. He had not intended to drift away. It's just that he always seemed to, they always wanted to seem want, to want time from him. And time is the one thing he did not have to give. He gave at the office. He was vaguely aware that his kids were growing up and he was missing it. From time to time, his children would complain about books that he wasn't reading to them, games of catch he wasn't playing with them, um, lunches he wasn't eating with them. But after a while, they stopped complaining because they stopped expecting that their lives would ever be different. I'll be more available to them in six months or so, he said to himself, when things settle down. And though he was a very bright guy, he didn't seem to notice that things never settled down. Besides, he said to himself when he felt guilty, I'm doing it all for them. Of course, this was not even partly true. He would have lived this way even if they didn't exist at all. He lived this way even though they begged him to change. But because they didn't move out and live in a cardboard box, because they lived in the home and ate the food and wore the clothes and played the video games that his money provided, he could say to himself, I'm doing it all for them. And no one knew him or loved him enough to tell the truth. He knew that he was not taking great care of his body. His doctors told him he had some pretty serious warning signs, elevated blood pressure, high cholesterol, and told him he needed to cut down on Twinkies and red meat and start an exercise program. So he stopped going to his doctor. There will be plenty of time for that, he said to himself, when things settle down, but he never realized things didn't settle down. He recognized that his life was out of balance. His wife nagged him about going to church. There was one, there was a church down the street uh, from them. He intended to go, but Sunday morning was the only time he could crash. He prided himself on being um, a practical man who lived in the real world where money is how you keep score. Besides, I can be spiritual without going to church. He said to himself, there will be plenty of time for that sort of thing when things settle down. One day, the chief of operations came to him and he said, we have an opportunity to go bigger and better than ever before, but it's going to take total commitment. And the guy said, I'll give it because that's where I get all of my energy from. But he said to his wife that night, do you realize what this means? We can relax. Our future is assured. We're set for life. I know the market. I've covered every base, anticipated every contingency. This means financial security. We can finally go on the vacation you've been pestering me about. But his wife had heard this before. She she had learned not to get her hopes up. At 11 o'clock that night, she went up to bed by herself as usual. While he was sitting by himself that night downstairs... An artery that had once been as supple as a blade of grass was now as dry as plaster and as stiff as old cement. The blood cells could barely squeeze through. Every cigar, every pat of butter, every angry word, every irritation-filled drive in the car, every self-preoccupied thought had done its work. Quite efficiently, irresistibly, his body was preparing to do him in. For more than half a century, his heart had been pumping 70 milliliters uh, Milliliters of blood with every contraction, 14,000 pints a day, 100,000 beats every 24 hours, all without his ever sending it a memo or giving it a performance review. Now it skipped a beat, then another, and a third, and he gasped for air, and he clutched his chest. His wife woke up at 3 a.m. He was still not beside her. She went downstairs to drag him to bed and saw him still sitting in front of the computer, his head on his desk. This is ridiculous, she said to herself. It's like being married to a child. He would rather fall asleep in front of a screen than come to bed. She touched him on the shoulder to wake him up, but he did not respond. His skin was alarmingly cold. Panicking, she felt a sick feeling in her stomach as she dialed 911. 
When the paramedics got there, they told her that he had suffered a massive heart attack, that he had already been dead for hours. He was such a big guy in the community that, that his death made worldwide news. And then came the memorial service. Because of his prominence, the whole community turned out. People f- filed past his casket, and they made the same foolish comment people always make at funerals. He looked so peaceful. Rigor mortis will do that to you. Death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. They ask the same foolish question people ask when somebody rich dies. I wonder how much he left. He left it all. Everybody leaves it all. They commissioned a headstone for his grave, and they wrote on it all of these inspiring words, visionary, innovator, leader, entrepreneur. And at the very top, they wrote the word, this man's favorite word, the word he had given his soul for, success. They put the man's memorial stone up, buried his body, and went home. Then when it was dark and no one was present to note what was taking place, the angel of God was sent to this cemetery Unseen and unheard, the angel made his way past all the other tombstones until he came to this man's wonderful memorial stone. There the angel traced with a finger the single word God had come, had chosen to summarize this wealthy, busy, respectable, successful man's life. And put the angel of the Lord, traced this word on his headstone. You fool. He thought he had it all together. But God said, this night, your soul will be required of you. And who's going to get everything you've worked for? Not you. Someone else. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, labels a person like that a fool. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the first four books of the New Testament. We call them the Gospels. It's the good news. You find out that when it comes to money and possessions, Jesus was definitely after something, but it's not, he wasn't after what you think. He never asked anyone for money, but what he asked for was their heart. And Jesus is the one who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if someone were to do an audit of your life right now, if they could look at your finances, if they could look at your time and your talent, would anyone have any clue that you treasure the kingdom of God? If not... Jesus labels that person a fool. So what I've done today is I've asked a a friend of mine, Benjamin, to speak and to talk to us today. If money were to talk, if this Benjamin could talk, the first thing he would say is, I'm a great servant, but a terrible master. I don't know what voices your Benjamins have, but mine is a pre-adolescent annoying voice and I do that to help you remember. I'm going to say it again. I'm a great servant but a terrible master. I'm going to be doing this for four weeks. Just (laughs) just letting you know. Jesus said this. Here's here's the thing we're going to find out over these next four weeks. If money could talk, they would say about money the same thing Jesus Christ said about money. Here's what Jesus said. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one or love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot. What's that word? Cannot. What is that word? You cannot serve both God and money. It is impossible. Second thing money would say, I can add meaning to your life. I hope you remember this. But I'm not the meaning of your life. How much does money get talked about at funerals? I mean, you could actually do a a search of all the sermons I've done. I have them all on my computer, on my hard drive. And I've never once talked about how much money a person made when when I was doing their funeral. And I've been to lots of funerals because I've been in ministry 37 years now. Been to lots of funerals. Never once have I heard another pastor talk about how much money someone made. I have heard them talk about how much money they gave away. And the people who give away the most tend to have the most friends and definitely have the most admirers. Those who give away the least die miserable and alone. 
Luke is the, Matthew, Mark, Luke is the third book of the New Testament. And Luke was written by a guy who was a doctor. He was a physician who decided to um, do an investigation of Christianity, write it all down in chronological order for people who weren't Christians. And when we get to Luke, we find out he, he puts a lot of parables. Parables are stories that have a meaning that Jesus taught. Jesus taught somewhere, depending on how you number them, between 35 and 40 parables. And 16 of his parables had to do with money because he knew we were going to struggle with money. So he taught a lot about money. One of the parables is about a rich man who had so much money to manage, he couldn't manage it all, so he had to hire a manager. Makes sense. In our day, we would hire a financial planner or someone to take care of those things. However, the guy he, he uh, hired was dishonest. The Bible calls him a dishonest manager, or the older translations say he was a dishonest steward. Steward's a great word because it means you don't own anything. You're taking care of something for someone else. And we as believers are stewards of everything. God has given us even our next breath. We're stewards. So this guy was dishonest. The master in the story, Jesus calls him the master, finds out about this. He calls him in and says, you need to give an account. I've heard you're dishonest. I've heard you're ripping me off. I want to see the books. He said, oh, and by the way, you're fired. Nobody? Y'all didn't ever watch The Apprentice? Thanks, Gary. Gary's the only one that got it. You're fired. All right. That's all I'm going to say about that. What this meant was now in this day and age, it, it didn't mean you were immediately fired. He said, you got a couple of days to get everything in order and then you're going to lay out the books before me. You're still fired, but I want to know where everything went. So this guy says, oh no, what am I going to do? I've been caught and, and you need to read this. It's in Luke chapter 16. Go home and read this today or, or this next week. He goes home and he says, oh no, I've been caught. He says, um, I'm not strong enough to dig ditches. I'm, I'm a, I've got no calluses. I like the air conditioning. I like sitting behind a desk kind of guy. I'm too proud to beg. What am I going to do? Jesus tells this in the story that he comes up with, a, with an idea. And here is the idea. He says, I know what I'll do so that when I'm out of work, people will welcome me into their homes. How's he going to do that? Here's the plan. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, each one, all of them. He, he worked for a rich man. Everyone who owed him money, he calls in and he says to the first one, how much oil do you owe my master? And this guy says, I owe your master 900 gallons of olive oil. He replied, uh, so the manager says to him, take your bill, sit down and quickly, quickly, because I don't have a lot of time and I need to work all of this stuff out. So quickly cut the bill in half and write down 450 gallons of oil is what you owe my master. And the guy who owes him is like, are you serious? I mean, I don't know if you've ever dealt with the, the, the uh, hospital whenever you've had hospital bills, medical bills, and, and you're trying to, you, we, we've had this several times. Hannah's appendectomy was $35,000. We didn't have that. We started paying 25 bucks a month. We're like, hey, We'll pay this till Jesus comes. Or if you want to negotiate, they're like, how about this? Sold. Whenever I was, you know, whenever I took my gun and then I got arrested, the first time I got a bill for that from TSA for taking my gun into an airport was $3,000. I was like, holy cow. We talked for a little bit and the guy goes, how about 500? I said, sold. 3,000 to 500, man, I can mow an extra couple of yards and pay that off just to get this taken care of, right? If you are a debtor and somebody cuts your debt in half, you're like, that's a great deal. If somebody were today, if you owed on your car, were to come in and cut a twenty. $20,000 car to a $10,000 car, what would you be thinking? I will take that deal, right? If you're the person who's owed money, how do you view, how do you, how do you view that deal? Not as well. You're thinking, this guy's a crook. No wonder he's getting fired. He needs to be sent to jail. First guy, 9,000, uh, 900 down to 450. Second guy he brings him in and he says, how much, how much wheat do you owe my master? And he says, I, a thousand bushels of wheat. And he says, hey, how about you knock off 200 bushels? Now, I don't know why I gave the first guy 50% and this guy 20%, but if you're the ower and somebody knocks off 20%, you know if you see a 20% discount at whatever your favorite store is or on Amazon, you're like, that's a great deal, right? That's what he did. He said, okay, great. And, and so both of these people said to him, man, that is so generous of you. Thank you. If there's anything you ever need from me, don't hesitate. And he's like, you have no idea how quickly I'm going to call in the favors. This is what he was doing. Jesus said he went to everyone 
of the people who owed his master money, and he gave them huge discounts. And when the boss finds out, because the boss always finds out, right? And Jesus calls him the master because he was the one who was over everything. When he finds out, everybody in Jesus' audience was thinking, this guy's going to jail, and he might even be executed because what he has done is so wrong in society's eyes. Now, you need to understand, if you've not heard this parable before, you may think the same thing. But Jesus is the master storyteller. And Jesus knew how to get his first century audience. He knew how to get his 21st century audience to lean in. And at this point, in every parable, there's someone who represents God and there's someone who represents the people that Jesus is talking to. The master, obviously, is God. And, and the dishonest manager is people, right? Look what he says next. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He commended this guy because he thought through with his limited financial resources, with his limited time, he thought through the future. Now, Jesus' audience is very confused, and I imagine some of you are very confused. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy deserves to go to jail. You're telling us that the wealthy guy who represents God commends this guy, this dishonest guy? What's going on? At this point, Jesus has them right where he wants them, and at this point, Jesus has you right where he wants you. And he's about to pull back out of the parable, which is just a story, a made-up story, to give you the point. And here's the point he wanted to teach his audience, and he wants to teach you. Go ahead and put that up there if you would. In the kingdom of heaven, the way that God views wealth and money and possessions is very different from the way you and I view it. Here's how Jesus says it at the end, uh, in Luke 16, 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. What's that word? For, now, I'm going to explain that in a minute. For the people of this world are more shrewd. That means they think through. They're more looking to the future. They're thinking through their opportunities, the little bit of time, little bit of opportunity in dealing with their own kind. The people of this world, the people outside the walls of this church are better at thinking about the future than who? Than are the people of light. Who are the people of light? Christ followers, we are. Now, don't think for a minute that Jesus is commending this guy's dishonesty. What he's commending is he took advantage of his time and his opportunity. In Matthew 10, 16, Jesus is about to send out his, his followers. And he says, I'm about to send you out into the world. You're going to be like sheep among wolves. And he says this, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent and doves. What he means is be wise and be innocent and know that people outside these walls are going to try to take advantage of you. But as long as you're doing what God's telling you to do, he's going to bless you. Now, what Jesus commended is this. Go ahead and put that next one up there. This dishonest guy took full advantage of his little bitty time and his little bitty opportunity. And I need to tell you, you got a little bitty bit of time. When, we, when, when somebody puts your tombstone on your grave, you're going to have one thing in common with everybody else in that cemetery. You know what it is? It's not the beginning of your life. It's not the end of your life. It's the dash. That little dash between I was born in 1964 and whatever year, that little dash, that sums up my little bitty bit of time and my little bitty bit of opportunity. And if you want to be commended by God, you better take advantage of your time and your opportunity. So you can't, send your, you can't take your money with you, but you can send it on ahead. And if you want to know how, you've got to ask this question. How do I get the maximum use out of my money in light of my little bitty time and my little bitty opportunity on this planet? Now, what Jesus is going to say next is for Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower, you don't have to do this. If you are a Christ follower, you better pay attention. This is not part of the parable. This is part of the application of the parable. Here it is. I tell you to use worldly wealth. What kind of wealth? There's other types of wealth. And I've had people say, well, I don't give money to the church. I give this. Well, you need to pay attention because he says use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, because it's always gone, and, and actually in reality, you're going to be gone. Your time's going to be up. You're going to leave something. You may leave nothing. But whatever you think you own, you're leaving behind. If, you, if you're leaving it behind, you don't own it. He says use it to gain friends so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal blessings or eternal dwellings. And everybody in Jesus' audience gasped because they said, Jesus is saying we can use what's temporary to impact what's eternal. Wow. 
And then listen to what he says. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. This is a principle not just for your finances, but for your time, for your service. The person who can be trusted to take out the trash in God's kingdom is great. The person who sweeps up, you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Sweep the floors. Because God says, when I notice you're, you're taking care of little things, I will bless you with big things. We have way too many people in the church. In this church, every church I've been in, oh, that's beneath me. Well, it wasn't beneath your Savior. If you're going to follow him, you need to do what he did. He was a servant. Remember when he washed the, the disciples' feet? That was the lowest job that anyone could have done in that room, and the only one who did it was the Son of God. You descend into greatness in the kingdom of God. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little, be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? It's a test. And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I just mentioned it. If money could talk, third thing is I'm a test. You want to know what this test reveals? Someone say yes. yes. It's a little serious in here. I want somebody to talk back to me. Here's what three things money will show, this test will show. Shows what I love most. Money shows what I trust most. Money shows if God can trust me. If I say I love my wife and I never spend any time or any money on my wife, would you or she believe that I loved her? No, love is actions. Love is not a feeling. Hollywood makes all kinds of money off of rom-coms, romantic comedies. That's not real. It's why, it's not funny. It's why all of these, these celebrities have sometimes double-digit marriages because they think that love is a feeling. No, it's an action. And by the way, if you're married, here's some great advice. You probably should write this down. Decide before you're married... If you, if you didn't, then you need to do this now. What percentage of your income you're going to live on? Because here it is. This, is. this is big. You need to write this down. You are going to live on a percentage of your income. That's big, right? Some of you are living on 110% of your income. That's what, that's what credit cards are for. If I can't afford it, I, I borrow from my future. And I think Jesus would say, that's foolish. You're going to live on a percentage. Wouldn't you rather decide which percentage you're going to live on than let circumstances of life tell you which percentage you're going to live on? Janie and I, before we ever got married, I said, this is a big deal to me. We will tithe. We will give 10% of our income to the church. She said, I'm all for it. So for 29 years, we've been tithing. And, and so we have to live on 90% or less. And if we're giving some to our, if we're saving some, putting some in retirement, that means we're down to 80% or less that we're actually living on. That's wisdom. That's what forward thinking, shrewd people do. They think about the future and they save. Not thinking, I don't believe for a second that my bank account is my savior. <laughs> I'd be a pretty weak savior but I know the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And, and I actually read a story years ago, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, where I, I got my master's degree from. They were about to close because of bankruptcy. And, and the, 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 the board of directors and the president were on their faces before God in the inner room, the inner sanctum. And one of them said, God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and we really need you to sell some right now. I'm not making this up. The secretary knocks on the door. I don't even remember the guy's name. So-and-so from such-and-such -such cattle company just sold, and I don't remember. It was a massive amount of, of cattle and wanted to donate the money to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I'd be going, okay, God, I, you're there. You're real. I know you're real, but wow. People who are commended by God don't live on 100% of their income or 110%. Now, um, I, uh, I struggle whether to, to share this with you, but after, after talking with Janie, um, she, told me that I, she told me to practice what I preach, and, and what I preach is that, that to be healed from your sins, you've got to confess. 
and I have an addiction. And uh, it's time I showed you a picture of my addiction. Put that up there. It's golf balls. Y'all were worried, weren't you? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. This is an addiction. I love playing golf. I love finding golf balls. It's like Easter. And so my record, my record on one day is 200 golf balls that I found. I, I regularly, like the other day, we just went in, Caleb and I were playing, we just went in for just a second. I found seven golf balls. I just handed it to him because, because when I did the math on this, that is right around 5,500 golf balls that I have. And, and so Janie, Janie really challenged me and she said, you need to think about what you're doing. And so here's a picture of me thinking. I gazed off into the horizon and I thought, and my thought was, that's not enough. I love, I haven't bought a golf ball and I don't remember how long. I'm telling Caleb because I finally decided I won't hoard any more than 5,500. Now, I actually have a goal to get to 10,000. And, and I'm not making this up either. I, I usually find about a bucket full of golf balls every month. And the reason I know that is because there's a minister's golf tournament that I play in every month, and, and my bag is so stinking heavy that I can't carry it anymore. And so I get another bucket, and I start pouring them in there. And uh, so once a month, and, and there's about 300 golf balls in each bucket. And they weigh 30 pounds. Each bucket weighs 30 pounds. The small tote here was 61 pounds, and the large tote was 101 pounds of golf balls. Now, I tell you this, I tell you this, because no matter whether you have a big bucket, a small bucket, a purple bucket, whatever it is, this bucket represents your life and your finances. And what you need to know, whether you have, whether you got 5,500 golf balls or none, they're not yours. Everything, even my next breath comes from God. And I need to spend a little time thinking about what my future holds. If you think for a second you own stuff, that's when it owns you. And you need to be very, very careful. That's what this whole series is about. How can we use more of our stuff, more than what's in my life to get more people into the kingdom of God? That's what we need to be asking. Because when Jesus, when you stand before God, he's going to ask, what'd you do with my son? Did you accept him? If not, depart from me. I don't know you. And he's going to ask, what did you do with what I gave you? Did you spend it on yourself or did you use it for eternity? When we sit around our table, one of my favorite things now is every Sunday after church, we go to our house and we have lunch and we sit around the table and not once have we sat around that table talking about how much stuff we have. Now, we might talk about how many golf balls I have today, but it's just to make fun of the Father. You know what we talk about and what I love? I love hearing my kids tell stories around the table. And we laugh and we have a great time. And then about 1.15, I'm, I got to go take a nap because I get up at, today I got up at 4.30. And, and so um, I'm tired by the time I, and I go take a nap. But I love sitting around hearing about stories. Well, here's one more thing that money's going to say. If money could talk, money would say to you. Do you want more stuff or do you want more stories? Because if you ask me to do your funeral, I'm not going to talk about your stuff. I'm going to talk about your stories. And quite honestly, there's some people when I do their funeral, I have no material to work with. My favorite funeral was a 93-year-old woman who, who went through more heartbreak than you could ever imagine. But if you were to have met this woman in her lifetime, she was the coolest woman. There was a nursing home she was at, and when I would be at that nursing home, she, she would see me, even if I tried not to see her. You know, sometimes I was in a hurry. Doug, come here. And she'd give me a big old hug, and she said, I was praying for you. And at her funeral, I said, I need somebody to take her place because this woman prayed for me every day day. And then when I found out her story, she went through more heartache 
than anybody could ever, ever imagine, yet she was the kindest, sweetest, most God-filled woman I'd ever met in my life. Nobody's going to talk about your stuff. They're going to talk about what you did. And, and, and I want people to talk about new life and talk about the things we did. Jesus said, if you give even a cup of cold water to a child in my name, you've done it to me, to Jesus. Well, how much colder does, does water get than the snow cones we handed out down at Quail Valley? It's frozen water. We're going to do a, a Be the Church on, on October 11th. We're going to have a, a night of worship out here on, on October 10th on the back parking lot. And we're just going to sing and worship the Lord. And then on Sunday, we're going to get up and we're going to put on our Ask Me About New Life t-shirts. And we're going to go and we're going to serve. And we're going to hand out some frozen water in the name of Jesus. Because I want people to know, we don't just talk about service. We're going to go serve. And you need to understand this. Every child that comes to faith, and we had one child come to faith at our sensational summer send-off. Every child that comes to faith, every husband that drags his wife in here and she hears something and she is changed. Every mom that drags a teenager in here and they hear something and they are changed. Every marriage that is saved, every drug addict that comes to know Jesus and gets their life straightened out, every teenager that comes to, to the landing and they get their life straightened out and they don't even have to go as far away as, as some of the adults did. You're part of that story when you plug in your life to this church. Don't ever forget that. It's not about you. It's what we do with what's in these buckets that matters. Now, like the manager in the parable, we have a little bit of money and a little bit of opportunity. And we're being tested. And our little bit of opportunity and our little bit of, of money is showing everyone around us whether we're really interested in the kingdom of God or the world. We're managing stuff for someone else. And if you don't believe this, I want to ask you, how many of you, how many of you are going to be buried with your house? You can try. That's really weird. Even if you try to take all of your money out of your bank accounts and you put it in your casket and they bury you, somebody's going to dig your dead butt up, shove your dead body aside, take your money, and live it up. It does not belong to you. So we need to be asking, how can we leverage what God has given us to impact the kingdom of God? Now, at the end of the story, at the beginning in Luke chapter 16, verse 1, it says that Jesus is teaching his disciples, but there's a bunch of people listening. There were always a bunch of people listening. There was one group that had no interest in what Jesus was saying, except they wanted to discredit him. They wanted to trap him because they could not stand Jesus. Listen to what happens at the end of, of this story, Luke 16, verse 14. The Pharisees who loved money, what are their names? Do you know their names? Neither do I. They're footnotes. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. Jesus said, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. Look at this. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. You want to know what God values highly? People. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I think the last thing this Benjamin would say to you today is, don't be a footnote. Pharisees are footnotes. King Herod, he's a footnote. Caesar, footnote. And the greatest story in history. You have an opportunity, I have an opportunity to make a difference forever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that you chase us when we're selfish, when we gossip, when we... Um, when we intentionally hurt others, you still love us, so teach us how to be a reflection of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we have one basket at the back. It is our joy basket. It's how we give at New Life Community Church, or you can give online, nlccp.com. Um, be sure, if you're interested in the marriage uh, night on, on September 26th, we need you to go ahead and register for that so we make sure we have enough snacks and, and all of those things. You can register by going to nlccp.com. On the front page of that is marriage night. Click on that. When you get there, you can either click on the picture that says marriage night, or there's a little sentence that I think the first sentence ends with, click here. It will take you to our portal. If you try to, if you try to 
register any other way, they're going to send you to somebody else's portal. So they're, they're keeping track of who goes where. If you, when you click on that, it's going to take you and it, and it may say search, put in 75801, 802, 803. We are the only one in those areas, the only church in those areas that's hosting marriage night. So you'll see it. You'll click on that. It's $15 per person, $30 per couple. And part of that money comes back to us and we'll, we'll have some snacks uh, based on that, that night. But be sure and sign up. It's going to be a blast. Some of the, some of the experts in, in uh, marriage, and then uh, Michael Jr., my favorite comedian of all times. Um, he's going to be speaking that night, so we want you to be here, be a part of that. Be sure and sign up. Stand up and socially distance as you leave this place. You're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>